The press conference. Back up to that. Awesome. I thought it was incredible. You, know, you have to understand when you go into that press conference last week. I'm trusting that you guys saw it. I saw some report. Something crazy. I mean, it was something cra- I want to say four million people watched it. Something like that. You know, with the reruns and the clips and the social medias and the YouTubes and uh, the live feeds and the ESPN news. Just everybody that covered it. Something like four million eyeballs had seen that, which is a raging success. But yeah, back up. Back up to the day that it happened. Connor went into that thing, and there was only two options, okay? And the reason I bring up Connor, we, this this isn't Khabib's world. We weren't expecting a lot from Khabib, and there wasn't a lot that Khabib could do. He's a humble guy. He's a gentleman. He's a sportsman. And this is not his native tongue, okay? It's a press conference where words are all that matter. Not just words matter. Words are all that matters. Khabib was up against it a little bit, so we'll focus on Connor. Connor only had two options, okay? Don't forget, this press conference taking place in New York blocked all fans from coming. So it's just the media. So the energy in the room is very light. There's not crowds waving his flags that have tailgated before this thing, and they show up drunk, and they're partying, and they're chanting for their countrymen, and hanging on every word he says. It's a different environment, and it's one that he has not been in before. So of his two options, he could come out, and he could be his boisterous, flamboyant self that everybody's hoping for. Or he could come in and just call this one in. Hey, the energy's not here. I don't have any idea why we're doing it. I live in Ireland. He lives in Russia. You flew us both to New York to promote a fight that's in Vegas in a room that nobody's at. I'm out. Ask me your questions. Get on with it and let, let me go about my day. That, that was a very reasonable assumption, particularly because that's exactly what he did in his final press conference with Floyd Mayweather. You know, the, the room was different. The energy, I was there. The room was different. The energy was different. It was mainly media. It was mainly insiders. You know, this guy's entourage and that guy's entourage and the undercard and their coaches and their entourage. It was just a different feel. Floyd went first and Floyd came up pretty stoic. It wasn't the brash bravado from Floyd. Connor went second. He kind of took his cues from Floyd. He came in a little bit down too. They had a weight weigh-in coming the next day. They had a weight cut. They had some stress. They just had some other stuff going on. It ended up being a pretty pretty bland atmosphere. Connor came out, okay, if you want to talk about firing on all cylinders, he had a machine gun in each hand. He had a machete tied to his back, and he had clips in his sock. It was fire, and there is nobody that could match him, and he beat Khabib at every turn. And poor Khabib was outmanned from from Jump Street. We understand that. But when you're breaking down a press conference and you're going to try this fight by words, body language, and ultimately public opinion, this was a slain like no other. And Connor came hot. And he addressed every issue. And it doesn't matter what the facts are. It's whoever says it last and says it the most compelling with a microphone in his hand on the stage. And that's exactly what Connor did. He addressed the he addressed the bus issue, which was such a black eye that he left in handcuffs under the jurisdiction of the DA and ultimately in front of a judge with a lawyer in tow. It was a bad action. He steered right into it. He turned it on Khabib. He said, why didn't you get off the bus? He said, the very first, don't don't bring up the dolly. Don't bring up the people that went to the hospital. The very first thing I did, I walked up to that bus with my hands up. I showed you my hands. I showed you I was unarmed. You versus me. And you didn't get off the bus. To hell with the facts. To hell with the tape that we've all seen. To hell with the handcuffs and the DA and the judge. Boom. Connor, (laughs) Connor just turned it. I couldn't believe it. I heard him say that. He tried to take credit. He did take credit. For coming in unarmed and displaying his hands to a 4,000-pound object known as a bus. Proclaiming, I get that Khabib just happened to be looking and and was supposed to see that and know what that meant. I have no idea. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It was a press conference. He proclaimed, I came in, I showed you my hands so you knew I was unarmed. They went back and forth. I mean, this thing was a mess. Khabib was doing the best he could. He was just outgunned here. And at one point, Connor had one of the best lines 
it was the best line of the press conference and one of the better lines that I've ever heard at MMA, and he got no credit for it. Either Khabib spoke as Connor said it or Dana spoke as Connor said it. And so it kind of, like, people couldn't hear it. You couldn't really hear it, but I picked up on it. And he told Khabib, you tap the window. That's all he said is you tap the window. But what he's alluding to is he's saying, when I came after the bus, you had enough. You tapped the window. You found your way out. You surrendered. It was a simple line. It was quick. It was, if you guys think about that, it was a brilliant line. It was absolutely brilliant. And Khabib had made many suckers mistakes in the press conference, which is he tried to ask Connor questions. Every time Khabib thought he had a very logical point that if you just focused on for a moment, if you just answer my questions while I interrogate you, you will burn yourself, you will run out of rope and make yourself look like a fool. The problem that Khabib had in that is that Connor is not under subpoena to be there. Connor has no obligation to take a question from anybody, including Khabib. So he did it. When he ignored Khabib and dismissed Khabib, he made Khabib look small. He made him look unworthy. He made him look like the kid in class with his hand up that the teacher's ignoring. It's very simple. It's a very simple tactic. I am only pointing this out to you guys so when you go out and you watch these press conferences and you come away with an emotion and a feeling, when you come out revved up, I'm identifying for you why. I'm identifying for all of the fighters that listen to this show, no matter how many times they've been setting that damn cage up and they've been doing these press conferences and flying people in from all over the world, when somebody shows up at this thing all dressed up and grabs the microphone and says, I don't have anything to say, I just want to fight, and puts it down as though they're going to get an applause from the crowd, and they never do, and they find themselves uninvited to the next press conference, which means they've been removed from main event or co-main event status, don't act surprised. You've got to deliver at these things. Somebody's going to be the hammer and somebody's going to be the nail. And there is a misconception in this sport from the beginning of time. And it's the same misconception that Khabib is under. And again, let me say, much like I had to do a moment ago and say this isn't a Barry John Jones, this isn't a Barry Khabib. I'm reaccounting for you simply what happened. That's all I'm doing. Not giving you a prediction on the fight, not even breaking down the fight, just telling you what happened at the press conference. But there is a misconception in this sport, and it continues to happen, that if you take on a big star, a guy that makes a ton of money, a guy that sells a ton of tickets and is over with the crowd, that if you take him on and you beat him, that you assume his spot, that you now make a ton of money that you now sell a ton of tickets, and that you are now over with the crowd. That is simply not the case. It is not true. On October 6th, Conor McGregor will wake up, the biggest draw in the UFC. On October 7th, Conor McGregor will wake up, the biggest draw in the UFC. There is an art and a skill to that. And the guys who are going to make it in this business and have a long career, and have a legacy, whatever the hell that word means, and the guys that seem to think that that matters and is important, for those guys, they are going to understand what it is Connor brings to the table. And it's not a straight left hand and a rear teep to the body. He brings something else. He brings an energy and an emotion. And no matter what happens, including a vicious and violent and ragdoll beating. Let's say Conor takes that from Khabib, a brutal, brutal beating. Conor McGregor will wake up the following morning, the biggest draw in the business. And he may not be as big of a draw as he is on the 6th. It may go down. He will wake up the biggest draw in the business. Khabib will not. Not a slide to Khabib. It's just important and understanding. I see guys go after spots, and a lot of it has to do with titles, and a lot of it has to do with jealousy, and a lot of it uh, just with a competitive spirit of, hey, that guy's where I want to be. Let me go take him down, and I'll take his spot. It's not like the olden day where if you kill the king, you become the king. It does not work that way. You have to bring other things to the table. You have to have intangibles that you bring to the table. There's not a recipe. 
You can't just throw in the flour and the sugar and the chocolate chips and the egg yolks and stir them up and put in the oven for 40 minutes and, and boom, the cookies taste the same. There's not a recipe. It is not black and white and it is not clear. Different guys bring different things to the table. Conor McGregor's last outing was a loss, just by example. It was like it never happened. You know, I, I'm using Conor's name because it's a big name and you guys will recognize it, but I could go ahead and use Eric Anders. Eric Anders was the fighter of the week for me, and he did it in defeat. In defeat, he was the best performance of the week. And I do not say this to be a condescending jerk. I don't know who beat him. I watched the fight. I could not produce that gentleman's name for you right now. He was a new face for me. He's tougher than hell. And I, I, I promise you I am not doing that. I don't even know who he is. I hate when people do that. I think his name was Tiago Santos, to prove my point. Nick, is that right? Okay. His name was Tiago Santos. All right, I guess I do know his name. My point to you is not to slide Tiago Santos in the slightest. My point to you is that Eric Anders fought so well and with so much heart that the conversations that I have been in since that fight happened were all about Eric Anders. They weren't about Santos. I watched the post-fight show. Dominic Cruz, who is known for being a bit cynical, I might add. Dominic Cruz goes, hey, guys, there is nothing that anybody on the roster saw from Eric Anders tonight where they're going to raise their hand and go, hey, let me fight that guy next. Tremendous compliment. I have to give him the same one, though. He was not the best-looking fighter I've ever seen. He did not have the most skill. Boy, was he tough. Boy, could he take a shot. Boy, would he come forward. Boy, would he give them back. And he'd mix it up. He'd know when to go for the takedown. He'd he'd know when to go for the left and when to go for the right. He was dog tough. He tried to get up in between rounds. He tried to get up in between rounds again. He tried to get up a third time before they finally stepped in and said, okay, we're all done here. The point I'm offering to you, not only to say something nice about a guy who deserves something nice said about him, but many times you will gain more in defeat than you do in victory. And we saw that happen with Connor versus Floyd. And you may have short-term memories, but to remind you, Connor lost that fight. To remind you, Khabib will be his next fight. To remind you, the predictions for this fight will be that it's the biggest in history. Even bigger than Conor's own fights, who currently holds the records. He's going in to outdo his own records according to the projections. And he's coming off of a defeat. There is an art to doing that. I don't offer to you that Conor is some brilliant guy who understands this art. I think a lot of it is very unintentional. But it happens all the same. A wise person would study it, and they would not just sit back and go, oh, wow, that was really great. He's a huge star. They will stop and go, why? Why was he so effective? Why was the change in his tone? Why was his refusal to answer Khabib's question? Why was making it country against country, making it political, making it personal, going after managers? Why was he doing these things? What was the cause and effect, and how did it make you feel? You have to be able to break these things down. You have to look at the number that 4 million people viewed a press conference that had absolutely no chance of a fight breaking out when the fight is only projected to have half as many people tune in and watch it. Why? Why, if we're fight fans and we love fighting, can we do double the numbers for a press conference? There was an international fight week a year ago. If I'm wrong, it was two. The way time flies, I can never keep track. And they had done a world tour press conference, which didn't mean that they covered the world. It means they brought fighters in from everywhere. They brought them out to Vegas. They set up a huge stage. It wasn't just two guys like we saw with Conor and Khabib. It wasn't four or six guys like we'll see for some big pay-per-views. 
They must have had 20 athletes up there on this. They had rows of athletes, rows of athletes. They were covering every card you could think of. They were covering international fight. They were six months ahead. They were covering cards. They flew in this very lovely gal from Brazil. She was all dressed up. She had her skirt on, her dress on, and her hair on, and her makeup on, and they asked her one question. It was a charity question. Some media reporter felt bad for her, like she was being picked last in kickball on recess in fourth grade, and decides to lob her one down the middle so that she can speak since they've flown her in from a different country. And she grabs the microphone, and she says, I don't like to talk. I just want to do the fight. And she puts the microphone down, and I swear to you, on everything I believe in, I would give you her name right now if I had the foggiest idea. She was never featured in a feature match again. She was never invited to another press conference. But she sat up like there like the cat that ate the canary that had this great answer after flying in from Brazil of saying, I've showed up to a press conference where I'm all, all I am allowed to do is speak And I showed up with nothing to say other than I don't want to say anything. Fair enough, young lady. Fair enough. Main events and co-main events come with built-in media opportunities. You cannot do one without the other. If you are put in that spot and you attempt to do one without the other, you will not be asked to come back to do one without the other. Like Vince McMahon famously said, the only thing I give anybody is an opportunity. What you do with it is up to you.